Hello, everyone, and um, welcome to our webinar on open source software. Uh, my name is Cathy Lauer. I am the industry officer in Elixir, and um, I am organizing these kind of events. So um, just before we start with the official part, I just want to go through some housekeeping um, things. So um, in the right top corner, you'll find the um, control panel, and there you can um, find all the features in this webinar, for example, during um, the presentations, we would ask you not to um, raise your hands, but ask questions by posting them in the questions box. You can find the tab for the questions box in the control panel um, where a little arrow points to questions. Please submit your questions during the talks there and um, the moderator will ask your questions then after the talk. Once um, the talks are finished, you can also raise your hand and then the moderator will unmute you uh, and you can ask your question in person. If you do not want to ask your question in person, please um, feel free to um, send your question in through the questions box as well. Okay, um, then after both talks are over and you quit um, the webinar, there will be one survey question and we would be very grateful if you could answer that. It's really only one question, um, but it would be of, um, of great value to us if you could answer that. Okay, so now we go to the official part of the program. Unfortunately, we have to make a, a tiny little change and swap the two talks since we're still trying to connect one of our speakers. Um, and now let me introduce um, Jen Harrow. Jen Harrow is one of, um, the of my colleagues here at Elixir. She is coordinating our um, tools platform and she will chair the two sessions. So um, chair, uh, Jen, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. It's with great pleasure that Carly Stresser and Alex Wade are here from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And they're going to present how we are support, they're supporting essential open source uh, scientific software. And this overlaps very much with what we're planning to do with the Elixir Tools platform as well. So hopefully you'll see the synergy between the two um, talks. So with great pleasure, I'll let Carly take over and, and start with her presentation. Thank you. So uh, thanks everybody for joining today. Uh, I'm here with Alex Wade from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and uh, we'll be talking about a program that we run within the Open Science uh, Program of Science called uh, Essential Open Source Software for Science, or um, EOSS, which is what we sometimes call it for shorthand. And um, I will let Alex uh, go ahead and introduce himself. Yeah, hi, thank you. Uh, so my name is Alex Wade. I've been with the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative for a couple of years. Um, one of the things that is uh, somewhat unique, I think, about, about our organization as a philanthropy is that we also have a substantial portion of our staff who are involved in the technology side of, uh, of the house. And so uh, I have the, the fortunate opportunity to work both on our technical program, building software and tools uh, for, for research for scientists, as well as working on the program side, as, as Carly mentioned, in our open science program. Um, my background, just for, for folks, I, I'm actually a, a librarian, uh, spent a number of years in academic libraries and then a number of years in industry before coming here to the Chan Zuckerberg. Carly? Great, so I'm Carly Strasser. I am uh, relatively new to CZI. I've only been there, uh, this is week four. So, um, but I've been working in the open science space for quite a bit longer, uh, for the last 10 years or so, thinking through how to uh, manage and share data within the research community. And um, I am the program manager for open science, uh, working with Dario uh, Terabarelli, who's the program officer, and then Alex as well. Okay, so let's see. Hang on here. Seems to be frozen. That can't be right, hang on. Huh. 
Not sure. There's something wrong with the go to meeting. Let me see. And sometimes it takes a little time to advance the slides if you use them. Yeah, uh, it, it seems as though my uh, system is reacting poorly. <laughs> I, uh, oh, here we go. Okay, now my mouse was frozen, so I wasn't able to um, click on any of the other windows. So am I showing Google Chrome or no? Got a blank slide right now. Okay, um, that is not right. So I'm gonna stop and then I'm gonna restart. Okay. Oh, I think it was Google Chrome that had a freak out. Okay. Now we are seeing presenter mode, though. There you ah. go. Um. Good. Okay. Crisis averted. All right. So um, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative was founded in 2015 by Priscilla Chan and Mark Zuckerberg. And the mission is really to build a more inclusive, just, and healthy future for everyone. So um, with that rather lofty goal, there are uh, three core initiatives that are uh, implemented within CZI to try and meet this goal. And one is around education, uh, another is around justice and opportunity, and then the third initiative is science, and that's the one that Alex and I are here representing. And the science mission is about supporting the science and technology that will make it possible to cure, prevent, and manage all disease by the end of the century. Um, so that's a mere 80 years away, which is, uh, means we should probably get started sooner rather than later. And within the science program, there are several different um, initiatives, things like neurodegenerative um, disease, uh, patient-driven research. There's, um, there's also some technologies that we work on developing. But uh, Alex and I are here representing the Open Science Program. And the goal of that specific program is to um, encourage universal and immediate open sharing of all scientific knowledge and outputs. So the strategy that we use to try and um, meet this goal is uh, fourfold. So the first is that we support platforms that enable rapid sharing of scientific outputs. So this is things like uh, preprint platforms and protocols IO, which allows open sharing of platforms. We also uh, remove barriers to knowledge discovery and access. And so that's thinking through um, how we can really uh, provide a better uh, way for scientists to tap into the network of science and all of the different uh, pieces of knowledge that are out there that are still kind of uh, disparate, despite the fact that we have the internet. Uh, the support and reward people that develop, share, and reuse essential open source tools, that's the element we'll be talking about today. And then the fourth uh, strategy is building computational capacity among biomedical researchers, and that's uh, primarily through currently partnering with the Carpentries, uh, but we're also um, looking at other ways to help increase computational capacity. So again, we're going to focus on that support and rewarding people element. Uh, and so to start, this is this lovely picture that hopefully we've all seen of uh, the black hole that was um, uh, produced a little over a year ago now, I believe. And there were lots, uh, hundreds of astronomers, engineers, uh, data scientists, uh, and folks that used raw data from all of these different telescopes, um, as well as advanced imaging software and reconstructed this image that we all saw. Um, but this image really doesn't convey how much more uh, invisible labor, labor was involved in the creation of the image. Um, so these are some uh, tweets from around the time that the uh, black hole image was released. And uh, Dr. Key Bellman, who is one of the team leads noted in her keynote, which is um, the picture on the left here uh, at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology that more than 20,000 people participated in the creation of the open source software that made this breakthrough possible. Um, and despite the fact that this is incredibly critical for things like uh, imaging black holes, 
um, most of these open source projects never receive any dedicated funding for maintenance. Uh, a good example of this is Matplotlib. Um, this is one of the projects that Dr. Bowman and her team used, and it's a Python library for 2D printing, uh, and it really is emblematic of the challenges that are faced by many open source software projects. Um, the project is named as a dependency by over 190,000 other software libraries. Um, it would be uh, an incredibly, one of the most impactful publications ever if we counted software dependencies as citations. Um, yet the project's lead developer is currently supported for only four to eight hours a week by their employer, and the project has received no dedicated funding for maintenance until we came along, but more on that later. Uh, and so this is really the premise that we were working from. The majority of open source software for science is undervalued and lacks funding for maintenance, growth, development, and community engagement, especially after that initial phase where it's linked to original research. Um, so uh, particularly in the US, it's um, easy to get funding for new flashy projects and for uh, things that are considered research. But when you start talking about uh, maintenance or uh, documentation or uh, feature enhancements, those become less critical uh, in the eyes of a lot of funders. So this is where our program came in, the Essential Open Source Software for Science program. And the goal here is to support the creators and maintainers of open resources that enable this collaborative and reproducible research like we saw with the black hole. Uh, and we really wanna make these critical contributions to science visible, fundable, and recognized. The structure of this program is that we give one year grants. There are between 500 dollars and $250,000. And we're doing this over uh, three grant cycles. Uh, and so I'll say more about those three cycles, but the funding can be used for anything uh, from documentation uh, to usability to project management or uh, community engagement. And really we encourage um, you know, that money to be used for whatever's gonna be best for that project to really keep it uh, keep it so that it's able to be depended on by all of those other open source projects. So this is the timeline. So we have um, started the first round of grants that, that uh, went live back in the summer, uh, last summer. EOSS2, which is the second round, started uh, actually very recently. I'll say more in a second. And then EOSS3 grants will be starting sometime in the summer. And so we don't have specific dates on when those uh, one-year cycles start, uh, hence the kind of faded, faded version of these bars. But you can see that there's going to be some overlap between all three of the grantee populations. And um, so we have already finished the uh, granting, at least, for the first two rounds. So for the first round of EOSS1, we, uh, we gave out 32 grants that totaled about $5 million. Uh, for EOSS2, we gave out 23 grants for a total of 3.8 million. And then for that third cycle, applications will begin uh, being accepted in June uh, this month. So just a, a couple of weeks away, June, June 16th. So the second cycle, EOSS2, those 23 awards, that was announced yesterday. So there's a URL here at the bottom of the slide where you can read more about that uh, on the Chan Zuckerberg website. And we're really excited about all of the projects that we were able to fund in this second round. Uh, we gave out a total now uh, over the first two cycles of EOSS, 55 awards totaling 8.8 .8 million. And we really try to span both um, foundational and domain specific tools. And so what you're seeing here is the number of projects that were funded in EOSS 1 in yellow and EOSS 2 in teal and the various domains that they represent, so neuroscience, imaging, genomics, et cetera. And then those last two bars, uh, actually last three bars, visualization, uh, machine learning and data analysis, and data management and workflows are really more of those foundational tools that are used across domains. So uh, we think about both of those kind of specific areas, but those domain areas do uh, need to be in the biomedical research space. So this is just a sampling of some of the projects that we were able to fund. The black represents um, EOSS1, and the uh, red projects are from EOSS2. OK, and with that, I will turn it over to Alex. Excellent. Actually, I have to mute myself, yeah. and then I'll turn it over to Alex. 
And now it's my turn to uh, figure out how to share my screen. All right. Whoa. I probably need to stop sharing. No? Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. We can see your screen now. Um, All right. Now I just have to get the right slide. Which is, Carly and I are using the same deck, just changing presenters. Here we go. All right. Are we back to the what we've learned so far slide? Um, we have lost you completely oh. now in the screen. Oh. Now it's just black. black. Interesting. All right. One sec. Oh, so, there it is. What we've learned so far. Okay. Good. Perfect. Now we see okay. your presenter mode. <laughs> of course. Uh, let me stop sharing. Let's see if I can try this one more time. I have multiple desktop windows here, and every time I do it, it pivots me away. Okay, are you still seeing my presenter mode? Yes. Um, yes. All right, I will do it there. without notes here. So I'm just gonna make stuff up. Woo! All right. <laughs> um, so as Carly mentioned, we've just announced um, the second round of grantees uh, just yesterday, as a matter of fact. And so um, partially I'll, I'll cover some of the, the, the deeper learnings that we got from the first round of grantees. And I'll go a little bit over what the uh, the actual uh, evaluation criteria was. Um, but one of the things that, that Carly alluded to was sort of this acknowledgement that we knew going in uh, from, from the outside of the, of, the, of the grant program that this was an area that was typically not well funded by existing funding mechanisms, but we were, we were very pleased and very surprised at, at the very positive community reaction to this. Um, uh, Abby Mays from, from GitHub yesterday, uh, for example, uh, calling us out. But, but specifically, some of our, uh, uh, one of our uh, imaging fellows, uh, Juan Nunez Iglesias, um, had, had really sort of uh, drilled deep into the, you know, the fact that not only is, are the, the makers and maintainers of open source software uh, not recognized when it comes to sort of grant funding, but they're not, not often not even recognized by their own employers. Um, they don't get uh, citation counts for papers. They don't, uh, they don't have you know, a lot of evidence to, uh, to back up. It's just, it is a tool, it's a resource that is used in the creation of research. And so um, we, we really felt from the outset that not only supporting these projects, but helping to recognize the people behind them are, uh, is important. And in the same way that, that Katie Bauman talked about the 22,000, 23,000 contributors to all the software packages that led to the black hole image creation, uh, Nature last summer put out a piece on the, uh, on the invisible foundations of software as well. So uh, that was very nice to see. Um, we're also starting from our press release yesterday, starting to see some, uh, some mentions of this as well, to organizations like TechCrunch. What I wanted to talk a little bit about here is, is to discuss the criteria that we use, because if, if we uh, don't have things like citation counts for software uh, to look at, for example, you know, what are the things that we can use uh, for impact and, and, and how can we evaluate the quality of a project? So internally, um, when we receive the applications in, we, we try to pair up uh, domain specific uh, scientist reviewers with our engineering team. As I mentioned at the outset, um, we have a large engineering team here, a lot of people who are involved in open source projects. And so we try to have a pairing of, of domain scientists with the, uh, with the engineering folks, looking both at how the, how the application, um, how the application is used in the science, and then looking very specifically at uh, the, the open source community in general. So, one of the questions that, that I'd be interested in hearing from the audience here as we get into the, the Q&A section is, what, what would you guys view as impact of your software? 
Um, we do ask the applicants to provide us with a bibliography uh, where they have been cited or mentioned in key research. Um, but we also look at a number of other factors, uh, like how many dependencies, for example, Carly mentioned the MATLAB uh, example earlier. Um, we look at uh, the number of forks, we look at the number of stars, and, and none of these um, in and of themselves do we think are, are really good measures of impact. Um, but taken as a, as a whole, it starts to frame a little bit of a picture of how broadly used is the software, um, is it mentioned in the literature, um, is it used in, in multiple domains, et cetera. Um, one of the other sort of challenges for us when we're evaluating the impact is when Carly showed the bar graph of the domain-specific software tools alongside some of the more foundational ones, um, we can't just look at it sheer numbers. These need to be put in the context of how big is the community? How, how large is the uh, single cell biology community compared to the community of people who are using uh, a visualization or a, uh, a workflow tool? So normalizing uh, that or looking looking at that through sort of a normalized lens becomes important when we're evaluating the impact of the project. Quality is, is one where um, we do look at it a little bit more through the lens of, of the engineering, um, not necessarily the quality of the software code itself, but the quality of the project. And I'll drill a little bit uh, more into some of the characteristics that we've seen from that. Um, one of the other aspects of quality is, is also getting into the, uh, uh, the sort of features that if it's a GitHub hosted repository, some of the features within that repository, are there onboarding guides, are there, um, are there forums? Um, how quickly is that community responding to uh, issues that have been posted? And these are all, again, indicators, we think, of the quality and the strength of the open source project in general. Carly also mentioned at the beginning uh, the, uh, the the notion that the, the, these grants are, are very open-ended. Um, we are not necessarily or, or specifically not looking for projects to come and say, uh, we're requesting X amount of dollars to develop this great new feature. Um, in many cases, it's it's getting to some of the back burner items uh, that, that the team hasn't had, had the time or the resources to deal with, such as documentation, such as uh, better usability, such as growing the community. Um, but it's really up to the applicant to, to put that together. And we then have to look at that through the lens of, okay, is it feasible? Is what they're saying uh, you know, really a practical approach within the budget that they're asking for? And does that actually move the needle? Does it move that project forward? And then finally, uh, diversity. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit uh, more about diversity, but but in this context for the evaluation criteria, we, we're actually looking more about uh, community community diversity. Is this uh, an application that was uh, created by one institution or one lab and all of the contributors to that project are still coming from that lab? Or is this multi-institutional? Is it, uh, is it uh, you know, represented globally from the community? Is it uh, a very, very uh, specific slice of a domain, or is it something where they've tried to bring in contributors across multiple do domains to get, get broader perspectives? And now I can't advance my own slides. Um, just to pick a, a, you know, a couple of, of anonymized quotes out of the round one uh, applications, and, and Carly you know, alluded to this earlier, um, one of the projects was a dependency for over 100,000 open source, other open source repositories, and yet it had never received any dedicated funding. Um, others were downloaded more than 10 million times in, in a week or a month or whatever. Um, I guess it's not anonymized since we already talked about Matplotlib earlier, but, um, but the, you know, the, these facts also have to be taken into the context, as I said, about you know, how, how broad or how domain specific are these resources. Um, this is not a, uh, intended to be a uh, sort of a scorecard that we use to evaluate the project, but this was a post hoc analysis that we did of the round one applications. And Carly earlier mentioned that there were 32 grants awarded in round one. The reason that this number here is 42 is that 
each grant application can represent more than one open source project. So, so this uh, assessment here is looking at the individual projects, not the individual grants. And if you look at the 475 open source projects that were uh, represented by the initial round of applicants against the 42 open source projects that, that were represented by the grants given, you see these very interesting deltas uh, around things like um, documentation, for example. 90% of the applicant projects had documentation, whereas 100% of the ones that we funded uh, ha had a documentation included with them. And if you look at some of the larger deltas here, um, things like having a community forum uh, can be a very strong indicator of the quality of the project. Now, we don't intend this to say, oh, if you have a community forum, therefore you are much more likely to get a grant from us. Um, that, that's, not, that's not the intention here. Uh, the intention was you know, for us to get a little bit more of a, a, an analysis of what are some of the characteristics of the things that met that quality bar for us as we did this uh, evaluation. Uh, we have yet to do the same analysis for the round two, but we should be doing that soon. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, the feasibility, um, uh, this also was looked at through the lens of what what amount of funds were being requested for, for each of the projects. Uh, roughly 50% of the applications that we saw, and this was consistent in round two, uh, asked for the maximum amount allowed. Uh, you could tell that people went to great pains to to put together their, their project budget, so that came in at $249,000.57. I was always very old admire the the the, uh, the math that went into doing that um, but we we have also heard one of the the sort of feedback and learnings that we've heard is that uh, one year cycles may not be the uh, the best for this so we may be looking if, if we can continue the program to expanding these to 18 month or two year uh, cycles with with the same amount of funding possibly uh, many times especially in the areas where people wanted to uh, hire a community coordinator, or uh, bring on an additional resource, uh, just the initial time from when they get the, the grant funding to being able to have somebody in the lab on the, on the ground working can take months and that can eat into the, into the project timeline. So, so that's one of the areas of feedback that we've gotten from a lot of our recipients is the, is the 12 month time frame. And then feasibility, um, or sorry, diversity is something that, that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, and, and talk about the, the, the aspect of diversity that we use in evaluating the applications. Uh, we don't actually look at uh, uh, gender or race demographics as an evaluation criteria, but we do do some post hoc analysis of this uh, uh, just for our own information. And we wanted to do this for the first round of EOSS and realized that we actually didn't have any of that demographic information. We weren't asking for it. So uh, one of the changes that we made in round two is to uh, optionally ask both the lead applicant as well as uh, the key personnel uh, on the application. Uh, I think it's up to five people, um, uh, optional information on, uh, on a number of different uh, sort of demographics about them. And one of the things that we were pleased to see, well, dismayed to see, was that only 15% of the applications were from uh, from somebody who identified as female or non-binary, but we were pleased to see that among the items that we funded, uh, that number rose to 30% of the, of the grantees. And similarly, if you look at all of the key personnel across all of the applicant pool, 33% um, of those were identified as female or non-binary, uh, whereas of the grantee pool, that was 47%. Um, so, just some, some interesting benchmarks. Again, not something that we use uh, as a evaluation criteria, but something that we certainly want to uh, encourage the, the participation, uh, more equitable participation in these projects. So where do we go from here? Uh, as Carly mentioned, we are um, uh, just about to kick off in, in a couple of weeks, round three of uh, the slated three rounds of this. Um, we will be looking at, at how we evolve the program beyond this, uh, this year and these, these first three runs of rounds of funding. But one of the nice aspects of the program from my perspective is not just the uh, role of the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative as a 
grant making body. Uh, but we also feel that there is value in bringing this group of people together as a community. Uh, there's, there's learnings that, that they can get from each other. Um, we've already seen a number of collaborations develop uh, from our initial convening that we held back in February. Um, we've also viewed this as an opportunity to bring in other resources, people from the carpentries, people from uh, other funding agencies such as the Wellcome Trust and uh, Sloan Foundation, et cetera, uh, joined us in this meeting. Uh, those grant making bodies are looking at other opportunities to, to embrace and extend this program. Um, but it was also an opportunity for them to hear some of the pain points from the open source development communities. As we've grown our cohort from the initial round of fundees that joined us back in February to the recipients that we announced yesterday to the third round of grantees that we, we hope to announce in late October, uh, we are planning on holding a virtual convening at the end of this year with the grantees from all three of these cycles together. Um, and then finally, uh, we have uh, uh, created a, a repository up on Zenodo of a lot of the presentations. Um, many of these are, are sort of very lightweight, uh, three to five minute lightning talks that our uh, attending uh, participants from the from the February meeting uh, presented, where we tried to foster some of these uh, sort of collaborations and create a thon events there. So we asked each one of the uh, open source projects to uh, create a slide that talked about what they thought their strengths their strengths were uh, both in domain knowledge in uh, in engineering development knowledge in community building and where they thought not sorry their deficits deficits were but some of the things that they wanted to learn from the other participants and we used this uh, as fodder feeding into a, a hack fest that we had later in that week if you guys are interested, we invite you to, to come into the, the Zenodo community and, and look through some of those uh, very short presentations there. So as we start to, to move forward, we are uh, trying to build some analysis tools on top of the people, the projects, the institutions, uh, and the, oh, the uh, we, you know, pause myself here, we, uh, we overlap our terminology sometimes and, and talk about projects as proposals. Um, but we look at both the proposals and what the, the grantees hope to achieve with the grant, as well as the software projects that are associated with them. And in many cases, if you looked at this through the lens of the, the entire applicant pool, you'd see a single open source project be a participant in multiple applications. And as we grow this community, we're seeing a lot more connections in this graph people who are associated with multiple projects, projects that are associated with multiple proposals, obviously uh, key institutions where a lot of those people are associated. And, uh, and we're using the, some graphical tools to start to not only analyze this community, but then to track where further collaborations are developing uh, from these communities that we're building. But we're also using this tooling to sort of assess uh, some of these common needs that we're seeing across these open source projects and all of that then is, is feeding into what are some of the ways that we can we as, as the chan zuckerberg initiative and and we as a member of a, a community of, of uh, funders how can we expand the scope and impact of uh, of this effort um, we've been talking with other funders and industry partners uh, about ways that we can uh, join forces on doing this or possibly cloning the program uh, so that it's repeatable and uses some of the same criteria. Um, and at the same time, uh, we will be looking at whether or not this is something that we can extend beyond the, the, the three rounds that we have been uh, allocated. Uh, and so with that, I think we are open for any questions that you guys might have. Thank you, that was uh, great. Alex and Carly. Um, while we change over slides, we'll start with a couple of questions. So Matthew wanted to know what's the success rate for EOS grant applications? I don't know whether you mentioned that in your stats. Um, it is roughly, uh, I'd say, 10 to 12 percent. Um, I know in the second round that we just concluded, 
we receive approximately 200 applications and we uh, uh, we awarded 23 of them. So yeah, 12%. Okay, perfect. Um, Trish wanted to know what are the metrics for success for the grants and who reviews the, the deliverables are met? <laughs> um, uh, what are the, uh, uh, the, the answer to that question is we're still working on that. That's a that's a really good question. In fact, you know, one of the things that we um, had stated at the outset, uh, one of the reasons that we did a rapid fire three rounds of of applications was that we didn't want to have um, long grant funding cycles and we didn't want to have a large gap in between them. And we actually announced that people who had applied for, even people who had received grants in round one would be eligible for um, reapplying or applying for renewal in round three. And what we failed to take, I think, fully into account is that uh, the reality of the situation is that we're, we're opening up the application pool for round three in two weeks, and yet the recipients from round one are just six months into, uh, into that grant cycle. Uh, so, they, uh, you know, according to their own timeline of deliverables on the project, uh, are are only, you know, not even 50% of the way through. Um, and because the nature of the applications are so varied, um, we we have sort of short-term and long-term uh, intentions for this. We certainly uh, have reports that are due back back to us uh, towards the end of the grant funding cycle. Uh, to, to outline the extent to which they, they've succeeded on their deliverables, but we're also interested in looking at a more longitudinal view three years from now. Um, what are the what's the evidence that we can point to that says that our investment in these open source projects actually had an impact on on the, these communities? And, and that's an area that we're we're still um, looking for better answers to. So Trish, uh, uh, if you've got some good ideas, please send them our way. So I have a question actually. Um... You, you presented your specific domains and, and how many applications you, you had around these domains, but are there any domains that, that there are not very many uh, open source software that you'd like to see applicants from? Is there anything missing for the biomedical domain? Uh, I've got an answer. Carly, do you want to take it down? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I, so, Obviously, there, there's a, a huge amount of variability in the extent to which um, subdomains of biomedicine are, are sort of computationally in, intensive. Um, we uh, we were happy to see in round two that uh, we had one of the first successful grants that was in clinical medicine. Um, I also wouldn't I wouldn't read too much into those domain uh, breakdowns that we showed in the bar chart. I mean that's that was really sort of intended for our own bucketization, and so we certainly don't have any uh, quotas in these areas. Um, in many cases, it was how we bucketed them so that we could apply subject matter experts to the evaluation process. So we had a lot of them that were sort of gray areas, um, and especially when you get into a lot of the more uh, cross-cutting foundational tools, we we tried to look at them through the specific lens of their applicability to biomedical research in uh, writ large, not their impact on science. Um, so um, I don't know that we've done necessarily a gap analysis on domains that we would like to see more applications from, um, but if we have, we could probably produce this, a similar bar chart that would show you the, uh, the the sort of inverse of that question is we did see a number of domains where we got a very high spike in number of applications, and um, and that's not necessarily reflected in the number of grants that we gave. So um, I you know my my comment of a twelve percent acceptance rate um, that wasn't necessarily true if you did domain slices of that. There would be a high level of variability with, within those uh, within those realms. So I'm not answering the question in terms of the gap analysis. We have done that. No, no, no. It, 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 it's perfect. Let's move on to Ava's uh, presentation, and we can continue this discussion at the end. So I do ask people who are on the line, please hold, because you can have more questions. Please post your questions as we're 
going to go now to Ava. Ava, can you hear me? Um, yes. Okay, perfect. So I just want to uh, introduce Ava Martin. She's a very talented PhD student um, under Salva Capella at BSC. Uh, she's extremely active in the Elixir Tools platform and she, especially around best practices. And she's going to give us an update on the Elixir Tools platform and the development of software fair metrics. So please to listen to you, Ava. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. So as Ian said, I'm going to introduce a little bit uh, of the tools platform, and then I'm going to explain how we are developing fair metrics for our research software. Okay, next, please. Next slide. I cannot. Okay. So uh, Elixir is uh, the organization in Europe that brings together the different resources for, for research in the life sciences. And what well, the aim is just to, to coordinate all, all that in a single infrastructure and to uh, help scientists with data sharing, uh, exchange of, of expertise, and also giving some uh, guidance and some standards. So there are two kinds of activities inside Elixir. There are platforms and there are communities. Communities are basically scientists in a specific domains, building infrastructure for their uh, domain and then there are the platforms that build infrastructure and guides and training materials that are not domain specific and that are more let's say technical the communities uh, give feedback to the platforms since they are the ones uh, using the the essential let's say uh, services so the tools platform uh, next um, has to do with with software has to do with tools and uh, its 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 aim its main goal is to improve the discovery the quality the interoperability and the sustainability of software resources so scientists can make uh, better analysis in this uh, direction we have uh, bio containers uh, containing uh, software containers uh, also bio tools that is a huge catalog of software of research uh, software in bioinformatics, uh, databases, uh, workflows, libraries, uh, command line programs, uh, any, any kind of software, uh, with very rich metadata that is manually curated, so scientists can go there and learn what options uh, are there. Um, in this, in this uh, also direction of interoperability, uh, there is a Galaxy, where to run and generate uh, bioinformatics uh, workflows. Uh, another uh, goal of the tools platform is help scientists decide uh, what software to use so they can use the most relevant and the most up-to-date software. Uh, for this, uh, we have the effort of Open Event, where that is a service for scientific uh, benchmarking and, and also uh, technical monitoring. Uh, another component uh, of the effort in the tools platform is the software best practices group that tries to uh, come up and describe um, guides for, for software management and software development. And finally, we have the sixth uh, uh, component here, that is the, the tools ecosystem. This the new tools ecosystem. It is not uh, totally finished yet. But the aim of the tools ecosystem is to be a centralized and a transparent repository where we put all the tools uh, mm, uh, workflows, uh, well, software resources in general, metadata, and integrate it there so the different services can consume them, or or also feed their own data to the to the to the repository. But the thing is that this would be the foundation for uh, sustainability of the of the different platforms that are now independent each of uh, the others, and also for. Uh, the interoperability of the different services, as you can see there in the in the diagram, uh, because they all would be uh, sharing their metadata. Uh, next. So the four main tasks uh, for the next uh, three years, the, in which the different uh, experts and people in the tools platform are going to collaborate, are the, the ones that we have here. Uh, task one uh, around packaging containers and deployment of software. Here we have this big effort of the, the tools uh, ecosystem. Then uh, we have another task for software best practices. Um, a, third, uh, a third task 
uh, that is uh, bio tools to continue uh, this uh, record of, of tools with uh, as much information as possible. And finally, we have uh, the task about uh, benchmarking and technical monitoring. And here is where we are doing the, the effort I'm going to talk about next, that is the Fair for Software uh, Observatory, uh, where we want to monitor for the universe of well, as, as many tools as possible, um, how fair they are, how good quality they are. Next. Next. This, um, this effort depends uh, totally on the other task. It, it is not independent. We need uh, the software best practices group because they are the ones uh, coming up with, the, with these recommendations and the necessary discussions around fair. Uh, we need the tools ecosystem because they provide us with the uh, rich uh, metadata. And we also need the bio tools because they also provide metadata. Next. OK, so before I, I get into the observatory and into the, the metrics we measure, for those who don't know what is FAIR, well, in 2016, people that were interested in making uh, uh, research data uh, reusable, and so to, take, uh, to, to make as much out of it as, as possible, published uh, what they called the FAIR Guiding Principles for Scientific Data Management and Stewardship, in which they, they described the, the conditions that uh, data should meet or, or digital objects in research should meet so to maximize uh, the, the outcomes of it. Uh, right now, it is widely accepted in the, in the scientific community that uh, adopting these principles is very necessary. And what we try to do, uh, next, next, uh, recently, and not only us, but other people here, we have uh, at the bottom of the slide uh, two, two papers. The first one is the one we, uh, if, uh, we published um, with this work, but there are other people, like people in the, the second paper working around this, that is adapting the FAIR principles for data to research software. In principle, since the, the aim of the authors were, was to, to define principles for, for any uh, scientific object, this should be possible, and we think it is possible. The, the exercise was basically about taking the different principles and see how, how to make them uh, useful for, for research software, I mean, to, to adapt them, basically. basically. Uh, so research software is not uh, data, but it can be very similar to data for, for some aspects. So, for example, when it comes to findability, in most cases, the only thing we had to do was to take the, the original principle for data and rephrase it for software. Like, for example, when we are talking about identifiers, because in, the, in that sense, a software, uh, or a code, a binary, is, is data. For interoperability, uh, on the other hand, uh, things get um, way trickier because research software, or software in general, is dynamic. It does things with data and it also interacts with other software. And it generally becomes very complex. So in this case, we have to reinterpret, that, reinterpret all the, the principles, extend them, and in some cases, propose new ones. For example, um, I, in the, the fourth principle, uh, that we, we added is uh, about dependencies that make no sense in, in data that are incredibly important for research software. So this way, we come up with the principles for, for software to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Next. But this is not enough if we want to monitor and really have a tangible idea of how fair a, a tool is or a piece of software is. We need something more concrete, more specific. So in, inside Open Bench and with the best practices group, what we are doing is trying to come up with metrics that are, let's say, like the, the conditions for the, for the principles. Like the, it's like principles with more granularity. So in this example we have here, for example, for F4, the software is associated, uh, the, the metadata of software is included in searchable uh, registries. We came up with four metrics that are uh, searchability in registries, in software repositories, and in literature. With the metadata we have from the ecosystem, or now from, from different sources, we can, we can uh, answer these questions about, is it, is it searchable in registries? Is it searchable in, in software repositories? Is it searchable in literature? Because it is more specific, we can, we can do that. So the idea is to make this uh, exercise for all, the, for all the principles, which we have done. 
well, I'm, it's, it's an ongoing process because it is collaborative, of course. So. Uh, next. OK, so how does this work? Once we have the, the metrics, it's time to measure them. So the first thing we, we, we need is data, of course. We take it from the ecosystem, and the ecosystem, the, the ecosystem uh, feeds itself from many different sources, as you can see there. Some of them, like BioTools and BioContainers, are essential uh, services of Elixir. Others, like GitHub, are not. Others are something uh, in the middle, like Galaxy. And what we do is take in all that information and put it into Open Image. The problem is that the ecosystem is not ready yet because there are many, many, many services to, to prepare, to, to add. So in the meanwhile, what we are doing uh, is using a development uh, mini uh, tools ecosystem. Next. Next. OK. So, so this development ecosystem uh, we come up with uh, is this. We go directly to the source and retrieve the metadata. Right now, what is in production are the, the ones with solid line and dash lines are still in development. Uh, so, so we are using uh, those, those, I'm considering those sources. We take the metadata, we put it into our infrastructure in a database, we integrate the data, and then since we already have the fair metrics, the only thing we have to do is just, is just see for each two, using the metadata of each two, if, uh, if the metric is fulfilled or not. And after that, we can make uh, visualizations so users of Open Image can see can see the, the conclusions and, and the state of that too. Next. So uh, although this is uh, still in, in progress, as, as you have seen, uh, we can still uh, make some conclusions about the the partial universe of bioinformatic tools we have. Right now, in Open Image, we have uh, twenty thousand two hundred and two uh, tools. And if we want to, if we want to see, uh, for example, um, about the about the licensing of the of this universe of tools, license is uh, is recommended by our best practices uh, group, and it is also an important uh, part for um, open source initiatives. So, um, what we see in the, in in our in the tools is that almost Half of them have no license, so bad news, because in, in principle, you shouldn't be even using that software. But for the other half, uh, most, of, most of them do have an open source license, which is very good, which is telling us that when developers um, bother, let's say, I guess they have the reasons, when they put the license, they, they choose uh, open source uh, licensing, which is uh, good news, I think. If we go a little bit closer to those licenses, we can see that almost half of them are GPL, and then we have uh, some not that big uh, variety, MIT, artistic, and, and others. Next. Next. Another uh, indicator that is uh, in, important in, in open source software uh, is making source code uh, publicly accessible. It's, it's essential. Uh, this is also part of the of accessibility in in the fair principles. Um, what we see is that for for our total of tools, um, the amount of tools with repositories with version control is about almost twenty four percent. We have seen these specific repositories uh, because of the because of the version control. We think is uh, very important. Uh, if we have a, look, a closer look at this, we see that GitHub is a uh, majority. But there are other, other let's say, repositories. Uh, why? I mean, why? Why is the version important? Because it, it is important for for uh, identif identification of the specific software and also to about the. Uh, it has to do with the provenance. So in fair, it is uh, very. It is important to have version control. But it is not everything. You can still have the source code without a version control. So if we go to the next slide, we see that although uh, many, many tools do not have a guitar or a GitLab, uh, many of them are in Bioconductor, for example, which is very, very accessible and very stable. And so and the, the source code is accessible too. 
there's metazipan, there's search for, well, search was also in the other. But in general, we can see that we have here some candidates for repositories, let's say, which is it is it is telling us two things. First, that we have we can add uh, new new sources to our ecosystem where we can fetch from which we can fetch data. And also, if we if we track this with time, we can see the different trends uh, in in repository use, for example. Next. Um, well, finally, um, uh, in, in this slide, what we are seeing is that, uh, unfortunately, uh, in, in general, it is difficult to get all the metrics uh, well and all the recommendations. Here we see that uh, normally, if a tool has a publication, it doesn't have a repository. So you, if you have the source code and the versions, uh, you don't have a, a, let's say a peer reviewed uh, description of this software. Uh, so this is this is giving us uh, hints about uh, for the then the the best practices group um, what to work on and what the recommendation should should um, should say for the developers in the community. Next. Next. Okay. So finally, uh, in the end, in this observatory, uh, what we would have is um, an idea, a tangible, let's say, idea of how findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible each tool is. And I would also like to remark that um, it is key that all this is done automatically. Why? It is the only way to for this system to be sustainable. It is impossible to do this manually. Um, this way, you can have uh, up-to-date, reliable metrics because you can you can rerun everything uh, as frequently as you want, and, and you can fetch data as frequently as you want. And you can also track the evolution of software in the community so, to see how things evolve, how how different uh, repositories become trendy or not, and and so on, and which we think uh, can be of, of very much uh, use to see if. What we say in the in the in the best practices group, the recommendations are being heard or not, and what is well in general what is going on with the with the universe of bioinformatic tools. Finally, next, next, I, I would say that the take home message is that in the Elixir tools platform, we are um, developing guidelines for fair software, trying to interpret uh, fair for software. Uh, and defining both principles and metrics, but also we are building and developing the infrastructure to make a, an automatic monitoring of, of the fairness of the bioinformatics software users. And that's it. Next, uh, thank you very much for attention. Any questions? Thank you very much, Ava. That was great. Um, we do have a question from Jim. It, it's probably more tools platform than uh, metrics. Do any of the components of the work packages address the problems of reducing the burden on researchers for creating and maintaining the formal descriptions of data and functionality? Sorry. Can you, can you repeat? Sorry. Um, do any of the components of the work packages address the problem of reducing burden on the researchers, uh, software engineers, on creating and maintaining the not formal descriptions of data and its functionality? Um, uh, in the case of, in the case of, I don't know about, uh, honestly, but which work package that would be, but. Yeah, I, I would say it was more onto the data platform probably than, than kind of would be a collaboration than particularly the tools platform. I don't think we're, we're really addressing that mm. at the moment, but it is a good point. Um, Kathy asks, uh, where would I find the Elixir open software resources and tools? Um, we were in the Elixir web page. Yeah, probably, and, and Bayrot Tools has all the list as well, I would say. Um, 
Uh, Jim, Jim was saying about keeping Viadoc tools to date with new versions of the software releases as his follow up, which um, Jim was was following up with um, his question was about keeping by dot tools up to date with new versions of the software when it's released. Um, well, I think by uh, well, you either in order to do that, you either do it as an author uh, from what I know how, how BioTools works or the creators in BioTools have to address that issue. But I'm not sure if, if I mean, there's a lot of tools for the vibrators to, to check. So the, the fastest way would be to, as an author, to just update all the information. Um, let, let's kind of open the floor up a little. We, we can, if anyone wants to raise their hands and actually ask a question, and I will ask um, Alex and Carly to come back as well so that we can have a more discussion if you want to turn your cameras on as well because i know there's a, a a couple of more questions probably more general as well um there's one one also from jim much of the assessment criteria appears to be have you set up gitlab github project and followed all the recommended practices Whilst I can see these of value, are you following up with new and emerging practices with open source software communities are supporting? So I think that's both to you, Alex, and, and possibly to Ava as well. Sorry, can you rephrase it? Sorry, it. Um, uh, it was much of the assessment criteria appear to it be, have you set up GitHub, GitLab projects and followed all the recommended practices? Whilst I can see this of value, are you following up new and emerging practices on the way of open software communities are supporting? Uh, so, so we aren't we are we're not setting up the uh, the GitHub repos directly ourselves. Our grantees are, but but certainly we are working with them. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, the convenings and the communities that we're building around these is, is specifically to uh, sort of raise the tide for, for all of the, the participant groups so that we can learn from each other, um, so that we can sort of establish some of these best practices. So some of the, the stuff that Eva just presented is sort of fantastic stuff that I'd like to take back to that community and, and uh, you know, have, have them participate in this as well, because I think this is great. Yeah, and I'll just add that um, our use of, uh, you know, traditional metrics is certainly um, uh, accompanied by also trying to think through what we should be thinking about and considering. And we're using conversations with our grantees to, and, and you know, kind of landscape reviews to figure out what those new types of measures and metrics should look like moving forward. So we're always happy to entertain ideas if if somebody has ideas on what we should be measuring instead chris do you have a question i see your hands up oh i actually took it down already but i i wanted to comment on a few of these questions about bio.tools uh, where it was asked like can we automatically update this stuff and of course in elixir we have another project that is about bio schemas to make sure that we annotate everything basically so that web browsers can easily find it extending on the schema.org principle and we've already shown you can actually harvest that yourself to see updates and we have for instance done that in the training field and i've been advocating repeatedly to also do that for biotech tools because then on one end, you would describe your tool only once and it would go on to biotech tools harvesting what is in the bio schemas including it would see things like updates and such, uh, which was one of the questions. And also you could use it the other way around. So if people really describe their tools on Biodal Tools, you could give them the Bioschemas description for free that they just could copy onto their website. It's not the first time I bring that up, but I think it's still important. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, Salva, you raise your hand. Do you have a question? Okay, so I have a comment 
and, uh, and uh, also comments. Uh, first one, uh, regarding the emergence of new trends and, and so on, that was the question before. Uh, I think there is a great work in Elixir, and I will use the, the work of the machine learning focus group, where a, a group of people in, with common interests have get together and have like some, you know, have a look of how machine learning model has been generated, how they are being produced, what the reviewers, when they are looking at the uh, per review publication, should be looking at what is, you know, a little bit of sort of uh, checklist. And I think that is relevant because we keep updates with the different and emerging uh, patterns in software, and then we collaborate to, to react to that and to propose solutions. Elixir many times is just proposing best practices, recommendations, and so on and so forth. Some of them are adopted by the community, some, some, some of them are not. So, and that is the reason because we have the, this idea of the observatory to see which one you know, are adopted by the, by the broad community. And then my second comment is about the, the, the bioschemas. Actually, the versions are really important, not just for registering software, but also when you do benchmarking, because it's not the same to do benchmarking with version one, version two, or version three. So that is one of the reasons because we are monitoring the use of bioschemas as an alternative mechanism to gather information about versions. So we, for instance, in Open Image, we look at the information that is in registries, the BioDot tools, for instance, but also uh, whether uh, resources have um, uh, annotate the, the tools with bioschemas. And I can say that around 25% of the tools that we're looking at at the moment, so that is roughly speaking, 5,000 tools are using already bioschemas. That's it. Thanks, Salva. Um, I have another question from Sarah. Um, this is again to Alex and Clara. In the fu uh, future, do you have plans for supporting projects aimed at en enhancing diversity inclusions in open science? Uh, so, uh, Good question. I mean, this is something that we look at across all of our uh, programs right now. So um, we don't have, uh, uh, want to go back to, to something that I um, hadn't mentioned earlier, uh, but in the first round of EOSS, uh, we actually asked for a diversity statement uh, as an optional portion of the application process. And uh, we had about uh, I can't remember the numbers exactly, but I think we had somewhere in the order of 60% of, um, uh, of the applicants included a diversity statement. Um, a, a number of those were, uh, you could tell, had, had been uh, thoughtfully constructed, you know, a smaller percentage of them. Uh, we can tell that the a diversity statement had been added to their GitHub repo uh, the night before their application was submitted. And so it felt a little bit more like, you know, ticking a box and, and getting that done. Um, but it was something that we actually um, implemented as a requirement in the second round. And when I mentioned that we, we actually looked at d diversity of the, uh, of the uh, contributor community uh, as one of the evaluation criteria, we actually did look at the, uh, the quality and the effort that, that had gone into the diversity statements. And as part of our community, started working with them more to not only develop uh, codes of conduct, but to sort of think through how they can create and maintain more inclusive communities. Um, this is something that started within uh, Carly and my and Dario's uh, uh, open science program, and it's something that we are are now uh, uh, making a requirement across all of our RFAs, uh, across all of CCI science. Um, in addition to that, we do have a number of other programs uh, that I'm not to, uh, well enough person to talk about right now, but we, we do have a number of programs that are looking at diversity in specific domain areas, especially uh, sort of fostering uh, uh, within early career uh, uh, researchers and sort of going down even into pre-secondary education uh, to, to encourage that. It's having done this, uh, worked on some of these efforts at, at other universities, you know, it's always easy to point to the sort of pipeline problem and say, well, you know, in, in our case, we only had 15% uh, of the applications with a PI who was a woman. Um, so, you know, what, what's the root of that problem and what's the root of the problem before that? And, and where's the best way, that, the sort of long-term way that we can help uh, contribute to, to better, better diversity within these domains? 
Okay, because of time constraints, we've got one last question, um, which is from Tony and, and others wanted to know as well about f uh, funding is one aspect, but the te technical issues are only part of it. What about fostering uptake around scientific communities? How would you encourage people to use this software, build communities around it and uh, contribute to it? So I think that's to Alex and Carly as well. Uh, yeah, community building is certainly uh, something that we're thinking a lot about now that we are uh, bringing in a second cohort of um, EOSS grantees. Um, I think the the question really gets at you know this bigger issue of sustainability of open source products of how you can um, grow the community of contributors, how you can ensure that um, it's being used and um, and and that the people that are actually um, going to benefit from that software know about it and can use it effectively. And I think um, we're constantly looking for good ideas on how to do that. But I think uh, convenings is a good start. Um, and then we're also thinking a lot about how to uh, provide services and support for the grantee populations in EO EOSS around things like um, budgeting or uh, community growth uh, for themselves, like how they want to approach that, um, what kinds of resources they might need to make that happen, how the documentation should uh, be constructed in such a way that it's usable and um, accessible by many populations. And so we're thinking uh, about how to do that moving forward. And I think it's a, a really good challenge for this next phase of um, the Open Science Program. Well, I'd like to thank Carly, Alex, Ava, for a fantastic uh, webinar and thank you very much all, all the people that attended and posted questions as well thank you very much thank yeah, you thank you all together you. one more thing thank you jen um and um the session has been recorded so if you want to watch any part of it again it will be on our youtube channel shortly okay thank you everyone thank you. and have a lovely day bye